Hi, in order that you can see who I am, I have placed a photograph of myself on the bottom left of the screen. My name is Glenn Alexander Thompson. My contact details are on the web. My website domain name, courtsontrial.com, is on the bottom of the screen. Now, on the screen now is the only photograph I could find of Ms. Lisa Kennedy. She is a senior rates officer with the Macedon Rangers Shire Council. Now, as I will shortly show, on 16th of December 2009, Lisa Kennedy committed perjury by giving flagrantly false evidence and by exhibiting flagrantly falsified documents in the Magistrates Court at Broadmeadows, Victoria. Now, to the centre of the screen is a paused copy of the so-called Courts Audio Recording Management System. I will play that in a moment so that you may hear part of Lisa Kennedy's flagrant perjury. Now, when I play that recording, I want you to take particular note that Ms Kennedy says that the council rate records, rate book, show no evidence of rating six individual lots. I will play that little clip twice so that you can be sure of what you hear Ms Kennedy saying. OK, listen in. Playing now. The rate books show no evidence of us rating them as six individual or three individual okay. lots, only ever as the one. The rate books show no evidence of us rating them as six individual or three individual okay. lots, only ever as the one. Okay, now, as you heard, Ms Lisa Kennedy clearly said that the council rate books show no evidence of the council rating six allotments. Now on the screen now is a copy of part of the rate book which was exhibited by Ms Kennedy and which she was referring to at the time of giving her sworn evidence. Now the top left red arrow on the screen now is pointing to where the rate book clearly says lot 1 on LP for Lodge Plan 135199. Okay, so on the screen now is a copy of that lodge plan, and lot one is outlined in red. So clearly there is one relevant allotment shown on that plan. Now the top right red arrow is pointing to where the rate book clearly says lot two on LP 135200. So on the screen now is a copy of that lodge plan and lot 2 is outlined in red. So clearly there is one further relevant allotment shown on that plan for a total of two allotments so far. Now the lower right, the, sorry, just the lower red arrow is pointing to where the rate book clearly says lots 3 to 6 on lodge plan 135201. OK, so on the screen now is a copy of that lodge plan and lots 3 to 6 are outlined in red. So clearly there are four relevant lot allotments shown on that plan for a total of six allotments. OK, those three plans are side by side on the screen now. Manifestly, the rate book clearly refers to and specifies the six allotments shown on those plans. Manifestly, Lisa Kennedy was bald-faced lying and did not and could not hold a belief as to her sworn evidence. She was committing perjury. Now, the rate book extract which Lisa Kennedy was referring to was an attachment to a fraudulent certificate prepared by the council's then CEO, Peter Johnson whose photograph is on the screen now, together with a copy of his certificate. Now a close-up of the relevant portion of Peter Johnson's certificate is on the screen now. And as you can see, underlined in blue, Johnson's certificate refers to a particular property, 
namely lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684. And then underlined in red, Johnson says that that unique property was previously described as lot 1 on LP 135199, lot 2 on LP 135200, and lots 3 to 6 on LP 135201, where the LP is shorthand for plans which are lodged with the Land Titles Office. Now that part underlined in red specifies six separate unique properties, namely lots 1 to 6 set out on the plans referred to. So in, t so in simple terms, Johnson's certificate fraudulently asserts that the, thing, that the single first mentioned property was previously described as the six second mentioned properties. Now at the time of writing and signing his certificate, Johnson was well aware that his certificate was fraudulently false because under the Torrens title system of property registration, a reference to a particular lot and plan number is a reference to a unique and discrete property which cannot be described by the lot and plan numbers of any other property at all, let alone by lot and plan numbers of six separate and discrete properties. Now, at the time of Kennedy and Johnson deceiving the court, the solicitor and barrister for the council were, respectively, Catherine Stiles and Richard A. Harris, whose photographs are on the screen now. Now, as I will demonstrate later, Stiles and Harris conspired with the council to bring fraudulent proceedings to court, and together they committed fraud on the court. Now, the purpose of the fraud upon the court was to conceal 30 years of property and rape fraud, which the council had been engaged in committing and concealing. So, in order that you may fully understand this instance of fraud upon the court, I will describe the property and rape fraud, which began in 1979. Now, my viewers, follow closely. You are about to learn how true high crime and corruption, including the briefly mentioned rape fraud and bank fraud and council property fraud occurs. On the screen now is a Google Earth picture of the township of Kyneton, Victoria, together with the 1979 boundaries of the government gazetted water supply districts. Now, also on the screen, at the top, from left to right, are photographs of Kenneth Raymond Buchanan, Dr. Bruce Reed, Dr. John Tickell, and Bill Scott. Now, at that time, those four men were engaged in a financially troubled property development in the township of Kyneton, about where the red arrow is pointing. Now, those four men were not, and are not, standard garden variety people. Dr. Bruce Reed became famous, or infamous, as being the doctor for Eston Football Club at the time when the players were injected with banned or unsafe drugs. Dr. John Tickell became world famous for his international best-selling health books and for being the co-developer of a number of large property developments. Bill Scott was a pharmacist and he became president of the Victorian branch of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia and was recently awarded the Monash University Distinguished Alumni Award. Buchanan went on to become Australia's equivalent of Charles Ponzi, who was a financial schemer and scammer of now world renown. Now, back in 1979, their financially troubled property development was at least in part financed by the mortgage arm of the Kyneton solicitors Palmer, Stevens and Rennick. Through their finance arm, Pearson R. Nominees, Palmer, Stevens and Rennick handled investments by local retirees and investors and which they lent out on mortgages. At that time, 
Palmer, Stevens and Rennick were solicitors for their development company and also solicitors for both the council and the water authority. At that time, all four of those men were account customers of my service station at Whittlesea, Victoria, and in 1979, Buchanan was unable to pay his, stu pay his substantial debt f to me for maintaining his Mercedes-Benz 450 SEL. Now, at that time, both Buchanan and Palmer Stevenson Rennick were highly motivated to rectify the financial morass which they found themselves in. And they, and at least the Shire engineer, Graham Wilson, resorted to further serious property fraud for that purpose. Now at that time, an elderly Kyneton couple, Bill and Bertha Davies, owned a property at Kyneton, and their certificate of title is on the screen now. Now you will observe the shape of the property defined on that certificate of title, and you will see that I have outlined that particular property in red towards the bottom of the Google Earth picture, which is on the screen. Now, because that property was outside the Kyneton Urban District, it could not be provided with a guaranteed water supply for residential purposes and could not be subdivided for residential purposes. Now, while fully aware of that fact, on 18th of September 1979, secretly from Bill and Bertha, Buchanan filed an application for a planning permit to subdivide that land for residential purposes. That application was in the name of Park Valley Proprietor Limited. Now, neither Buchanan nor Park Valley owned or had any interest in that land at that time, and the owner's consent, that is Bill and Bertha's consent, portion of that application was blank. In September 1979, secretly from Bill and Bertha, on inquiry from Buchanan, the Water Authority resolved that it would provide water to the subdivision. Then on 21st of November 1979, secretly from Bill and Bertha, in knowledge that a guaranteed residential water supply could not be made available, the Council approved that application and a condition of that permit which issued was that each and every allotment be serviced with a water supply. At that time, Buchanan held a valuation which valued the proposed allotments with water supply at a total of $369,1979. The cost of road and water, water supply construction was $37,000. So the value of the land, with the permits in place, was about $330,1979, which is well over $3 million in present-day money. Then, by transfer of land, dated 23rd of November 1979, Buchanan concealed the fact of the approvals and purchased that land from Bill and Bertha Davies at its rural value of $65,000, which was $265,979 below its true value with the permits in place. The Water Authority did then illegally pro provide domestic water to the subdivision. Then the Water Authority resolved to legitimise to legitimise that illegal water supply and resolved to extend its urban district to include that subdivision. That extension to the urban district was gazetted in the Government Gazette. In about 1988, while researching these things, I telephoned Bill and Bertha Davies, who were then listed in the Kyneton Telephone Book. 
They told me that they had no knowledge of the application for a permit, let alone the fact of the permit, and they said that many Kyneton people were surprised that Buchanan could get permits where no one else could. Buchanan and Palmer Stevenson Rennick and the Council and Water Authority fair and square defrauded Bill and Bertha Davies out of about $3 million in today's money. Now, as I said earlier, Buchanan could not pay his account at my service station and he certainly did not have the funds to purchase that land off Bill and Bertha Davies. Now, to overcome that little problem, in October 1979, before he had purchased it, and before the council had even approved the application for planning permit, Buchanan purported to sell the land by sham contract of sale. And then with the help of crooked bank managers, he assigned that sham contract of sale to the then CBA, now Westpac Bank, and thereby raised the money to purchase the land. Now, that aspect is superfluous to this video, but full particulars of that fraud with the bank are on my website in the support pages to this video. So now I begin to get into the details of the rate fraud and further property fraud. Now, Buchanan's intention was to subdivide the major portion of that land into 18 residential allotments and to subdivide the small portion which juts out at the top into six industrial allotments. So the first thing which Buchanan did was to subdivide it into two parts, namely the residential portion and the industrial portion. Those two portions were set out on Plan of Subdivision 134684, with Lot 1 at the top being the industrial portion and the remainder, Lot 2, being the residential portion. Now back at that time, the Victorian Sale of Land Act prevented the sale of allotments on subdivisions consisting of three or more allotments until such time as the Registrar of Titles had approved the plans and in turn the Local Government Act prevented the Registrar of Titles from approving plans until such time as all required infrastructure such as roads and water were complete. So, in other words, a developer could not sell land on subdivisions or three or, four, three or more allotments until the roads and water supply etc were completed and the Registrar of Titles had approved the plans and issued new certificates of title. Now, not being one to let inconvenience like the law get in the way, Buchanan and Palmer, Stearns and Rennick and the executive of the Council and Water Authority conspired with one another in a scheme to enable Buchanan to avoid the law and sell the proposed allotments in breach of the law. I will particularise that scheme shortly. Now, on the screen now is a notice of, a notice of disposition of land which sets out that Buchanan and Palmer Stevens and Rennick sold in fact non-existent properties by contract dated 7th of February 1980. Now those sales were highly illegal because the proposed plans of subdivision had not yet been filed with the council, much less filed with and approved by the Registrar of Titles. Now those flagrantly illegal sales were manifestly made because Palmer, Stevens and Rennick and Buchanan were self-assured that the corrupt, probably on the take, Council and Water Authority executive would, facil would facilitate the scheme to avoid the law. Now, this scheme involved the Shire engineer, Graham Wilson, whose photograph is on the screen now, duping the councillors into sealing illegal two-lot plans of subdivision which were contrived to create 
fraudulent two-lot subdivisions. Now the plans which I showed you before are back on the screen now. Now those plans were, the sub, were for the subdivision of the top portion of the plan which was on the, on the certificate of title which I showed you earlier. Now those plans were and remain simply illegal. The law required the plans to show all allotments intended to be set out and in this case Buchanan's intention was a six lot subdivision and none of those plans comply with the law. Now as I said Buchanan's intention was to subdivide the major portion of the land into 18 residential allotments. So in order to avoid the law in respect of the residential subdivision as well, Buchanan prepared a series of highly illegal two-lot plans of subdivision. Three such plans are on the screen now. Now on the leftmost plan you can see an area which I have outlined in red and marked and it is marked as lot one. That represents a genuine intended allotment and the area outlined in blue is a sham or scam allotment which is marked as lot E. Now on the centre plan the area, the area which was lot 1 on the first plan is marked NIS for not in subdivision. The genuine allotment outlined in red on the second plan is part of the sham or scam allotment on the first plan and the new scam or sham allotment on the, on the uh, second plan is marked as lot F. Now that scam or sham sequence is then continued into the third plan which is on screen. Now that scam or sham se sequence is then continued in a further several plans in the series until 18 genuine allotments are set out and created. Now this little scheme operated in the following manner. Firstly, Buchanan filed a legitimate notice of intention to subdivide together with a lawful and legitimate plan showing all intended allotments with the council. The Shire engineer, Graham Noel Wilson, then submitted that legitimate plan to the council and the council approved that legitimate plan and resolved to require the developer to complete all necessary roads, etc. In this case, the council considered the legitimate plan on 20th of February 1980. The Shire engineer then destroyed the legitimate notice of intention and the legitimate plan and did not serve a notice requiring the developer, Buchanan, to construct the roads. Buchanan then filed a series of sham notices of intention to subdivide and each notice was accompanied by one of the series of sham and scam two lot plans of subdivision. Then, in breach of the law, the Shire engineer did not refer any of those plans to the council as he was required to do. The Shire engineer then treated each of those sham notices, notices of intention and sham plans as separate subdivisions. The Shire engineer then separately referred each of those separate sham plans of subdivision to the various statutory authorities which he was required to refer them to. Then, in his engineer's report to the council of 21st of May 1980, the Shire engineer specifically referred to the single legitimate 18 lot plan of subdivision which the council had considered on 20th of February 1980 and then he fraudulently represented to the council that that plan had been submitted in seven parts and he, re and he recommended 
that the council seal each of those seven parts. By representing that the original plan had been submitted in several parts, the Shire engineer deceived the councillors into a belief that they were in fact dealing with the single subdivision which they had considered in February. By that fraudulent representation, the Shire engineer concealed that the seven scam and sham plans in fact represented seven separate subdivisions which had no planning permits and which had not been approved by the council and were contrived to facilitate avoidance of the sale of land act and contrived to legitimise the flagrantly illegal sale of land by Buchanan and Palmer, Stevens and Rennick. The ignorant, the ignorant shopkeeper, farmer and teacher councillors then dutifully accepted the engineer's report and they resolved to seal each of the sham and scam plans. Then each sham and scam plan was separately filed with the Victorian Land Titles Office. Then, by letter dated 24th of November 1980, while knowing full well that Buchanan had not constructed the roads, etc., the Shire Secretary wrote to the Registrar of Titles and fraudulently advised him that Buchanan had complied with the Council requirement to construct the roads. Then, relying on that letter, the Registrar of Titles approved each of the scam and sham residential plans on 28th of November 1980. The Shire Engineer and the Titles Office Processing Officer were each well aware that the plans were in breach of the sections of the Local Government Act and the Transfer of Land Act which required a plan of subdivision to show all allotments and roads intended to be set out. That little sequence ended up with a series of approved subdivisions without planning permits and without roads or water and where the council had not resolved to require Buchanan to construct the roads or waterworks. The council and Buchanan and Palmer Stevens and Rennick processed the three industrial plans in identical corrupt and criminal manner, accepting that the Registrar of Titles never did approve those plans and the allotments or properties never came into existence. Now the entire purpose of this scheme was to enable Buchanan to sell in fact non-existent properties before the required infra infrastructure was complete and before the Registrar of Titles had approved the plans. Now in, set, now in September 1980, Buchanan offered me those six in fact non-existent industrial properties and I agreed to purchase them for $45,000. Buchanan said, said that he had, all, he had arranged with the CBA, now Westpac Bank, to finance that purchase. He took me to the Thomastown branch of the bank where the manager, John Musket, had all documents, including the contract of sale, fundamentally prepared. They showed me the letter of valuation, which valued the six allotments at $12,000 each, and Musket claimed to have also valued them. They represented that Buchanan made his subdivisions self-financing by selling allotments cheaply and then using the funds raised to complete the works which the council required to be done. They represented that the council had approved the plans of subdivision and that the plans had been filed with the titles office and were in the process of being approved by the registrar of titles and I was led to believe that the six industrial allotments existed as separate and saleable properties. The bank, the bank then took a mortgage for $47,000, 
which represented about 65% of the valuation of the six allotments. That mortgage was over the industrial portion of the land, namely Lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684, and which the bank knew had a true value of about $5,000 or about 10% of the mortgage. At that time I was led to believe, and I fully believed, that I had purchased six separate and saleable industrial properties. Now at that time, Palmer Stevens and Rennick filed a notice of disposition with the council and advised the council that I had purchased the industrial portion. However, that notice of disposition had a typographical error. It erroneously said that I had purchased lot 1 on plan of subdivision 124684 instead of 134684. Then, incredibly, the council made a further typographical error and it opened a rate record in my name which erroneously recorded the plan number as 124604 instead of 684. So the rate record for that property had two typographical errors in the lodged plan number. Then, at about that same time, without formal advice that I had purchased the six, in fact, non-existent industrial allotments, the council also opened a rate record in my name for those six non-existent properties and purported to rate them. At the time of opening that rate record for the six allotments, the council was well aware that each of the plans for those six allotments were endorsed with a notice to the Registrar of Titles that the plans were subject to an unfulfilled requirement that Buchanan construct the required infra infrastructure and that the Local Government Act prevented the Registrar of Titles from, a from approving those plans until the Council advised the Registrar that the requirement had either been withdrawn or fulfilled. The Council therefore knew well that the Registrar of Titles was prevented from approving the plans and therefore knew well that the six allotments did not exist. So at that time the Council had an active rate record for the parent property, albeit with an erroneous plan number, and concurrently the Council had an active rate record for the six child, child properties which it knew did not and could not exist. The Council then began to serve me with rate notices for the six allotments which it knew well did not exist and it did not serve me with the rate notice for the parent property which did exist. On the face of it the Council was intercepting the rate notices for the parent property, excepting for the rating year 1985-86, when one slipped through. In all probability, it was the then Shire Engineer, Graham Wilson, and or the Shire Secretary, Stan Porter, who intercepted the rate notices for the parent property. They were both involved in facilitating Buchanan's and Palmer Stevens and Rennick's property fraud. It was not until researching in, to understand the fraud on the court in respect of the rate claim that I realised the two typographical errors and then understood the significance of that rate notice. By purporting to rate those in fact non-existent properties, the council was party to and provided very similitude to the fraudulent misrepresentations of Westpac and Buchanan and Palmer Stevens and Rennick when they purported to sell me those in fact non-existent properties. By the way, the property being Lot 1 on LP 124604, as per the typographical errors, is situated at Bullen Bullen, which is hundreds of kilometres from Kyneton. 
So at that time, each of Buchanan, Palmer Stevenson Rennick, Westpac Bank and the Council were all fraudulently representing that the six industrial allotments existed, whereas the fact known to each of them was that they did not exist at all. Initially, I dutifully paid those rates, but in about 1983, the Council and Water Authority became engaged in the very serious further property fraud which had been described in the Victorian Parliament. From that time, I refused to pay any rates at all to the Council. Then in 1987, the Council issued Magistrates' Court proceedings against me to claim those unpaid rates. That claim included unpaid rates on the six, in fact, non-existent properties and on other properties. At that time, I served the Council with a notice of discovery to compel it to provide all documents related to the rate claim. The Council refused to comply with that notice of discovery. My solicitors then swore an affidavit seeking court orders that the Council comply with discovery. The Court ordered the Council to comply with discovery. The Council refused to, to comply with the Court order. The Council's rate claim was struck out on the 27th of October 1988. Manifestly, at that time, the Council knew well that it was purporting to rate properties which did not exist. Shortly thereafter, I learned that the six industrial properties, in fact, did not exist at all. I also learned that the manager of the Thomastown branch of the Westpac Bank, Westpac Bank John Saviour Musket, was on Buchanan's payroll and was a director of one of Buchanan's companies. At that time, I told the Westpac Bank that I would never pay the monies owing under the mortgage for the industrial land. The bank never made further request or demand for payment. Westpac Bank and I subsequently settled in 2009 at about exactly the same time as the council was committing the perjury discussed earlier in this video. I will discuss that settlement in context and in my favour a little later. Then in 1991, the Council made a further fraudulent rate claim in the Magistrates' Court. At that time, I told the Council that it could go hopping to hell because the purported rated properties did not exist. By letter dated 11th of December 1991, the Council withdrew its fraudulent rate claim and paid my costs. Now the real fraud begins. Watch and learn. You will see how truly corrupt councils operate. Now, it was at this time that the Council and its rate, rate department began cooking or falsifying the Council rate records and setting the ground for what it knew would result in the eventual perjury and further fraud upon the court in respect of the rates. Now, the last fraudulent rate notice for the six non-existent industrial properties was for the rating year 1990 to 1991, and the relevant portion of that rate notice is on the screen now. Then for the following year, the Council did not issue a rate notice. It was probably still considering how to cook the books. Then the Council issued a rate notice for the year 1992 to 1993, and the relevant portion of that notice is also on the screen now. <coughs> now, what occurred was that the Council cancelled the rate record for the six non-existent properties, which were rated as property number 33040101105. The Council then opened a new rate record for the parent property, namely Lot 1 on Lodge Plan 134684. 
The council then fraudulently transferred the valuation of the six, in fact, non-existent allotments to the new rate record. At the time of fraudulently transferring the valuation, the council knew well that the value of the unsubdivided parent property was far less than half of the value of the six, in fact, non-existent properties. In addition, the council transferred the purported arrears of rates on the six non-existent properties to the new rate record and fraudulently represented that money to be arrears of rates lawfully levied on the parent property. At the time of transferring those purported arrears, the council was well aware that no such arrears existed. Then, over the next few years, the council fraudulently levied rates at the inflated value which had been fraudulently transferred. Then the council manipulated the valuation on the new rate record until in 2000 it had reduced the valuation to less than half of the valuation which had been fraudulently transferred. Now, the fraudulently transferred valuation was said to have a valuation date of 1989. So in 2000, that property had a rating value of less than half of the 1989 value which had been fraudulently transferred. The council knew well that no other property in their records experienced such devaluation over an 11 year period. On the face of it, at least the entire rate department was party to that fraud. It could not occur without connivance. Then, in 2000, the Council issued a further overtly fraudulent Magistrates Court summons to claim the rates. That claim fraudulently represented that all of the outstanding rates had been levied on the parent property. The court ordered a pre-hearing conference or mediation before the clerk of courts of Bendigo. Lisa Kennedy was present at that conference and the council was represented by yet another crooked lawyer, John Buman of Bendigo. At that conference, the council's solicitor presented the document which is on the screen now. Now that document purports to be a rate book search on the parent property, but it is not. It fraudulently includes the rates purportedly levied on the, in fact, non-existent properties. Now, as you can see, that document purports to be a rate search on council property number 6258000150. And title details of lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684. Now that document represents that that rate book search returned the list of rates for the years 1983 to 2000. Now the simple fact is that prior to 1992 the property number set out on that document simply did not exist. That property number was first allocated when the council started cooking the rate books in about 1991. The property number for the rates in the period 1983 until 1991 were in respect of property number 33040001105 and the title details were the six in fact non-existent properties. That document is simply a fraudulent fabrication. The entries alongside the blue line which I have put on that document do not relate to and cannot be found by the property search details quoted on that document. That is a fabrication by the council rate department and is entirely equivalent to perjury. The Council Rate Office 
purposefully fabricated that document intending to deceive the court. I simply pointed out to the clerk of courts that it was a fraudulent fabrication. Lisa Kennedy burst out crying and that was the end of that conference. It was on researching my defence to that fraudulent rate claim that I discovered the further fraudulent things which gave rise to the Supreme Court proceedings before Justice Robert Osborne and the Court of Appeal. That discovery was that in 1987, the then Shire engineer, Graham Wilson, had committed perjury and falsified documents in the Bendigo Magistrates Court in respect of this exact same subdivision. Full details of that perjury are now set out in my YouTube video entitled Judicial and Cultural Corruption in the Supreme Court of Victoria and which video is available on my website. So the fact was that separated by 13 years the council was committing perjury in the same magistrate's court and in respect of the same subdivision and as discussed later the council continued that chain of perjury in 2009. Now since publishing the initial version of this, pres of this present video the predictably corrupt Victorian justice system wrote to YouTube for the purpose of concealing from Australians the matters and things set out in the video which is depicted on the screen now. Now amongst other things, other most serious court-based corruption, that video particularises that for the purpose of concealing corruption in the Victorian justice system, Robert Osborne, that is Justice Robert Osborne, fraudulently fabricated purported reasons for judgment which exactly repeat and represent as fact the in fact perjury and falsification of documents by the council in earlier court proceedings. That video also details that Victorian Court of Appeal fabricated orders and reasons to conceal Osborne's corrupt conduct. In order to conceal those things, the Victorian justice system fraudulently represented to YouTube that there was a legal complaint from the Victorian government. As a consequence, YouTube has blocked that video from being viewed in Australia. It remains available to overseas viewers. Now, there was in fact no such legal complaint or court orders. That was a further act of corruption by the Victorian judicial system. Significantly, it may well have been the Chief Justice herself who wrote to YouTube. Anyway, I chose not to appeal to YouTube. I chose to leave that video blocked. I instead published a further YouTube video which exactly repeats the material in the blocked video and additionally points out the justice system corruptly blocked the initial version from Australians. The opening screen to that new video is on the screen now and a link to that video is in the description to this video and at the end of this video. Now those proceedings before Osborne and the Court of Appeal put the Council's fraudulent rate claim on hold. Now, as I said earlier, in 2009, I first published my website, and at that time I published the details of the corrupt conduct of Osborne and the Court of Appeal judges, and I also published the fact that Westpac Bank had financed the purchase of the in fact non-existent properties. I then contacted Westpac Bank and referred the bank to my website. Westpac settled with me at that time and wrote off the by then $1,100,000 debt. The terms of that settlement are set out in the deed of settlement which is on the screen now. Now amongst many other things that deed of settlement sets out that the six properties rated by the council never did exist 
and that the, and that the bank deceived me and took a $47,000 mortgage over a property which it knew had not been subdivided and had a true value of about $5,000 at that time. For those interested, a copy of that deed is available on my website as a supporting document to this video, which is also available from my website. Then, at essentially exactly that same time as the bank settled with me, the overtly corrupt council renewed its by then increased fraudulent rate claim, which included a claim for the rates on the in fact non-existent properties. By that time, the council had cooked the rate records for a period of 18 years, and before that it had purported to rate, in fact, non-existent properties for a period of 11 years, for a total of 29 years of crooked rates. Now, included in the perjury of Lisa Kennedy, which I will shortly demonstrate, was a denial that the council had rated the non-existent properties at all, whereas the fact known to her and the council was that the council had rated them on a single rate notice which aggregated the rates on all six allotments. So, in order that you may understand aggregation of rates and Lisa Kennedy's perjurious denial, I will now demonstrate a complete example of rates on a number of separate properties being aggregated onto a single rate notice. Now, under the then Local Government Act, if a ratepayer owned several contiguous or side-by-side -side properties, a council could aggregate the rating value and the rates for those several properties onto a single rate notice. Now, on the screen now is a plan of cluster subdivision. Now, you will see lot 10 pointed out by the lower red arrow and lot 12 pointed out by the upper red arrow. Okay, so now on the screen now is a plan of subdivision which subdivides each of lot 10 and lot 12 into three smaller allotments each. Now, for the present purpose, I am concentrating on lot 10. Now, on the screen now is the certificate of title for that lot 10. Now, when that plan of subdivision was approved, the property being that lot 10 ceased to exist, and three entirely new and contiguous or side-by-side -side properties, namely lots 72, 73 and 74, came into existence. Now, on the screen now is the, is the certificates of title for each of those separate and discrete properties. Now, quite clearly, the, proper, the property being the unsub, unsubdivided lot 10 ceased to exist when that subdivision occurred. Now, on the screen now is a rate notice which specifies the new properties and sets out the aggregated rating value of, so, of those three discrete properties and also sets out the aggregated rates levied on each of those three discrete properties. Now, on the screen now is a council's valuation field card, which the council valuer completed when aggregating the rating value of those properties. And as you can see, that card specifically refers to each of the three discrete properties, namely lots 72, 73 and 74. Now, if I were to sell one of those allotments, one third of that value and portion of one third of the aggregated rates would be apportioned between vendor and purchaser. Now, also necessary for understanding of the crass and flagrant fraud upon the court by the council and its lawyers 
it is necessary to understand the basic concepts of the Torrens title system of property registration as used in all states of Australia and in numerous, numerous other countries and states around the world. So, for my viewers who are unfamiliar with the Torrens title system, I provide a quick lesson. Now, under the Torrens title property registration system, a property developer files plans of proposed subdivision with the Land Titles Office. The Land Titles Office then assigns a unique and discrete plan number to such lodged plans. Now, such plans set out the dimensions and location of the various unique allotments shown on those plans, and each such allotment has a unique number assigned to it. The said dimensions and location of each such numbered allotment is the unique and discrete description of each such numbered allotment. Such a description defines a single unique and discrete piece or parcel of land. Now because the earth is not physically cut into portions, such allotments or pieces or parcels of land are notional. They do not physically exist. So once lodged, a reference to a lodged plan number and lot number is a specific reference to a particular unique and discrete notional piece or parcel of land which is described on that plan and having that lot number. Such notional pieces, pieces or parcels of land do not exist at law until and unless the plan is approved by the Land Titles Office and a certificate or record of such notional existence is created. Such notional pieces or parcels of land cease to exist when the Land Titles Office cancels their certificate their certificate or record of existence. Now manifestly, a parent piece or parcel of land cannot coexist with child pieces or parcels of land subdivided from it. The titles office must and does cancel the certificate of a property which has been subdivided and the parent piece or parcel of land ceases to exist. Now in Victoria, Australia, such certificates of existence are certificates of title having a unique and discrete volume and folio number allocated by the Titles Office. In property transactions, a reference to a plan number and lot number or volume and folio number is sufficient reference to or description of a particular notional piece or parcel of land. But, but, but the plan and lot number or volume and folio number is not the description per se. Now, to graphically illustrate the notions which I have just described, on the screen now is a Google Earth picture. Now, on that picture, there is no way to ascertain what blocks of land exist by looking at that picture. The vacant land in the middle of that picture may well be an extension of any one of the neighbouring blocks, or that vacant land may well be divided into 20 smaller blocks. It is simply impossible to say without looking at the plans of subdivision which are held by the Land Titles Office. So it is only by looking at lodged plan 134684, which is filed with the Land Titles Office, that we can see that a notional piece or portion of land exists. And I have outlined that notional portion in yellow. Now, on the screen now is a plan of subdivision which subdivides that yellow block into two. Then, as soon as the Land Titles Office approves that plan, the parent notional block ceases to exist, 
and two new notional pieces of land are created, and I have outlined those two new parcels in red and blue. So now to place those two graphics side by side, you can see that it is impossible for a parent parcel of land to coexist with the new parcels which it is divided into. A parent property or piece or parcel of land must and does cease to exist when it is subdivided. Okay, so now I come to the 2009 proceeding where the council and its lawyers committed fraud upon the court and the magistrate, Mr Bernard Fitzgerald, also committed fraud upon the court by not performing his judicial function and instead simply accepting and parroting the fraudulent representations put to him by the council and its lawyers rather than having regard to the facts and the law known to him. Now, as discussed earlier, the claim originated in 2000 and at that time the council rates officer, Ms Lisa Kennedy, burst out crying when I pointed out the fraudulent nature of the document which is back on the screen now. As also discussed earlier, the claim was then put on hold for nine years during the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal cases discussed earlier in this video. So, in 2009, the Council served an amended claim, which is on the screen now. Now, that claim makes the fraudulent representations which are underlined in red, namely that the rates claimed were levied against property owned or occupied by me, whereas the fact known to the Council was that during the period 1983 until 1991, the rates were purportedly levied against properties which did not exist and could not be either owned or occupied or rated. My primary defence to the rate claim was bulletproof and was set out in subparagraphs 34G and H of my written defence and which subparagraphs are on the screen now. Now as you can see, paragraph G states the incontrovertible facts that the plans were never approved by the Registrar of Titles and that the land being the allotments set out on them never existed lawfully or at all. Now, in that paragraph, the reference to the land being the allotments set out on the plans is an unequivocal reference to notional pieces or parcels of land described and, dis and defined on plans of subdivision, and the fact that they never existed is incontrovertible. Paragraph H flows from paragraph G and states the incontrovertible fact that the council did not and could not validly rate those allotments which were set out on the contrived plans and which land never existed as allotments on plans capable of being approved by the Registrar of Titles. Now the statement in that paragraph that the land never existed as allotments on plans capable of being approved was also an unequivocal reference to notional pieces or parcels of land. And the fact that those notional pieces or parcels never existed is also an incontrovertible fact. Ipso facto, the rates purportedly levied were not lawfully levied at all. The council purported to make a reply to my, to my defence, but in fact did not. It was only after the hearing and after I, I appreciated the fraud on the court which occurred, that I realised that the Council did not reply to my paragraphs 34G and H of my defence. Now, as I, as I will shortly show, the Council and its lawyers specifically fabricated their case to counter the incontrovertible facts of my paragraphs 
34G and H. The hearing came on in the Magistrates Court at Broadmeadows, Victoria on 16th of December 2009. Ms Lisa Kennedy, the council rates officer who had burst out crying nine years earlier, was witness for the council and the council was represented by solicitor Ms Catherine Stiles and barrister Mr Richard A. Harris. Now Harris opened the council's claim by making false submissions to the effect of the amended claim which I discussed a few minutes ago. Lisa Kennedy was then sworn in as witness for the council and the first thing she did was to introduce the palpably fraudulent certificate of the council CEO Peter Johnson and which, and which certificate is back on the screen. Now as discussed earlier, that certificate makes the palpably fraudulent representation that the parent property, namely Lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684, had previously been described by the lot and plan numbers of the six non-existent properties. Those representations are simply in the face of the law and the operation of the Torrens title system. Unbeknown to me, at that time, that certificate contains a hidden, further, overtly fraudulent representation, which only becomes apparent as the fraud of the council becomes known. I will discuss that hidden misrepresentation in context a little later. Next, Richard Harris questioned Lisa Kennedy and asked her what she had to say in, res in respect of my defence. Now, I will sh shortly play a further little audio snippet so that you may hear Harris's question and Lisa Kennedy's sworn evidence reply. Now, the things to listen for is that Lisa Kennedy says to the effect of, th of the things which are on the screen now. Namely, once the council sealed the three plans for the six allotments, the council began to use those lot and plan numbers as a new legal description for the same piece of dirt. And when I told the council that the titles for the new allotments never issued, the council reverted back to the original title and her representation as to law, namely, we have to rate all land. OK, listen in. I will play that little audio snippet now. Here's one further matter, if I could ask you. you. You heard Mr Thompson indicate that the rates that have been levied on this particular land uh, ought not to have been levied as we gather because the land didn't exist. Mm. What do you say about that? The Local Government Act says that we have to rate all land. We all are aware of that. Um, the description used is Council sealed some, a plan of subdivision. It was able to be taken to the Titles Office. When Council sealed the plan of subdivision, the uh, subdivision sealed plans were handed over to the developer or the owner at the time and Council's Rate Office then starts to use that let new, as a new legal description. Still the same piece of dirt, for want of another word. Um, it's still rateable under the Local Government Act. Once it was identified to us by Mr Thompson that those titles were never issued, we reverted back to the original parent title, thus the lot, lot one on that plan, new plan of subdivision, um, one, three, four, six, eight, four. Okay, now you heard Lisa Kennedy say the things which are on the screen. I will discuss those things shortly, but first I'm going to play a little clip where Harris was in discussion with the magistrate. Unfortunately, unfortunately the magistrate had his microphone switched off, so he is a little hard to hear, but there is no mistake as to what Harris said. The magistrate was saying that the rated property was described as slick slots. Then Harris interjects and refers to the new plans of subdivision 
for the six allotments. And then Harris says what's on the screen now. Namely, the fact of the matter is we are talking about the same piece of land. OK, listen in, playing that little audio clip now. Yes. 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 And that was because of lodge plans being lodged, as I understand, by the previous owner of the property. But the fact of the matter is, we're talking about the same piece of land. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now you heard the council's barrister say the fact of the matter is that we are talking about the same piece of dirt. So. On the screen now is both Lisa Kennedy's sworn evidence and Richard Harris's statement, and as you can see, they are essentially identical, in that they both said to the effect that after the plans were lodged, the council was still considering or rating the same piece of land. Now, because my mind was fixed with the true concepts of the Torrance Tidal System, I was absolutely confounded by those utterances. The fact, of course, is that under the Torrens title system, plans of subdivision create entirely new, unique and discrete notional pieces or parcels of land, and the unique and discrete parent notional piece or parcel of land simply ceases to exist. So their statement as to new legal description for the same piece of dirt and same piece of land was an obvious nonsense. But at that time, and for the entire balance of the hearing, I was confounded and could not grasp the notions which they were putting to the magistrate. It was only after reviewing the hearing that I came to understand their fraud upon the court. So, I will now explain the notions and concepts of their fraud upon the court, and then I will demonstrate how they committed that fraud upon the court, and that the magistrate simply parroted their fraud, their fraud rather than performing his judicial function with regard to fact and law. Now, their fraud upon the court consisted of two parts, and two or, or two overtly false and fraudulent notions and a misrepresent, misrepresentation as to law. I will first deal with the two notions. They are, firstly, the fraudulent notion with regard to the same piece of dirt, and secondly, the fraudulent notion with regard to legal description. Okay. So, to explain the same piece of dirt notion, back on the screen now is the Google Earth picture with the vacant block of land near the centre. Now that vacant physical or actual block of land, as distinct from notional block, is fairly well delimited by fences and tree lines. Now, under the notion put by the council, to the, uh, to the magistrate, that actual block of land was initially referred to as Lot 1 on Plan of Subdivision 134684, and then after the plans of subdivision were lodged, the council referred to that self-same block or piece of dirt according to the lot numbers and plan numbers of the six allotments. Then, under the notion put by the council, the council levied rates on that self-same block of actual dirt. Then, after I told the council that the six allotments never existed, the council reverted to referring to that same piece of dirt according to the original lot and plan number. So, the council's representation was that it, had, that it had at all times levied the rates on the self-same actual or physical piece of dirt, which was referred to as Lot 1 
on plan of subdivision 134684 when the rate claim came to court. So the same piece of dirt notion relates to actual land defined by fences and trees and has no regard at all to the notional blocks defined and described by the Torrens title system. Okay, now I will describe the council's legal description notion. Back on the screen now is Lisa Kennedy's sworn evidence and as you can see she said to the effect that after the plans for the six allotments were sealed the council began to use those lot and plan numbers as the new legal description for the same piece of dirt. And then after the council learned that the, that the titles for the six allotments never issued, the council reverted to using the original, the original lot and plan number as the legal description for the same piece of dirt. Now, as put to the magistrate by Lisa Kennedy, a lot and plan number per se is of itself the, descrip the description or descriptor of or for a physical or actual block of land which is delimited by fences and trees. So, with that preposterous notion in mind, back on the screen now is the relevant portion of Peter Johnson's certificate. So, on reading Peter Johnson's certificate, we now see, firstly, underlined in blue, Johnson says that the property situated at lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684. Now, on the face of it, that's simply a preposterous statement. A property situated at lot 1 of plan of subdivision 134684. What does he mean? Well, what Johnson is referring to is the vacant actual physical land which is on the screen and delimited by fences and trees. Then, underlined in red, Peter Johnson carefully says that that actual physical block of land was previously described as the lot and plan numbers for the six allotments. Now, as used by Peter Johnson, those lot and plan numbers per se are of themselves the description or descriptor and according to Johnson they were used as such by the council to refer to the same piece of actual land or dirt which he says is situated at lot 1 on plan of subdivision 134684. So Peter Johnson's certificate and Lisa Kennedy's sworn evidence have the identical misrepresentation, namely that lot and plan numbers per se of themselves are the description for physical actual land which is delimited by physical boundaries. Now the obvious fact is that Lisa Kennedy's representations and Peter Johnson's representations are false and precluded by law. The simple fact is that, at law, a lot and plan number is a specific reference to a single, unique and discrete notional piece of parcel of land and cannot, of itself, be used to purport to refer to any other piece or parcel of land, notional or not. So, there is two ways to read Peter Johnson's certificate and both are fraudulent misrepresentations which were intended to deceive the magistrate. The first way is according to law and the Torrens title system and as discussed earlier, in the face of the facts and the law, Johnson's certificate fraudulently and preposterously represents that a particular notional piece of land was previously described by the lot and plan numbers of six other unique and discrete notional pieces or parcels of land. 
The second way is as fraudulently represented by Lisa Kennedy and Peter Johnson, namely that lot and plan numbers per se are of themselves description or descriptor for actual land defined by fences. To read it the second way, one has to first understand the fraudulent concept or notion that a property is not a notional piece or parcel of land which is described by, men, by dimensions set out on plans lodged with the titles office, but is instead physical or actual land delimited by fences. Okay, now Lisa Kennedy's representation as to law is on the screen again. That representation was that the law requires the council to rate all land. Now, as used by Lisa Kennedy, that representation was false and intended to deceive the magistrate. In the context of the fraudulent notions which I have just described, Lisa Kennedy intended to deceive the magistrate into a belief that the law required the council to rate all physical or actual land delimited by fences, whereas the fact is the law requires the council to rate all notional pieces or parcels of land defined by lot and plan numbers lodged with the titles office. Now, the entire purpose of the fraudulent misrepresentations of Kennedy and Johnson was to deceive the magistrate into a belief that the rates which had in fact been levied on the six non-existent notional properties were in practice or effect levied on the single physical block of actual land defined by fences. Now, after representing that lot and plan numbers per se of themselves are descriptions or descriptors for actual land defined by fences, the council and its lawyers represented that the lot and plan numbers for the six allotments were or constituted a misdescription of or for the single physical block of land defined by fences. Now, these preposterous representations befuddled and confounded me. So, in order to make sure that I was not mistaken as to my understanding of their preposterous representations, I addressed the magistrate as to my understandings, and Lisa Kennedy interjected and confirmed that my understanding of their representations was correct. Now, I will shortly play the audio clip of that exchange, and the things to take note of are as on the screen now. OK, playing that little clip now. Perhaps we can make it a little bit more clear and, and absolute. Um, my understanding of what they say, that is, is that they never individually rated each of the lot one on lodge plan, lot two on lodge plan and so on, and then aggregated them. It was merely a misdescription. It was at all times the single block. Uh, the rate books show no evidence of us rating them as six individual or three individual okay. lots, only ever as the one. Is it, is it from those rate books. books. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think that makes it clear enough. Well, I'm saying <laughs> is your questions um, were um, during the period 83 to 1990, uh, when the plaintiffs uh, uh, printouts and rate notices refer to six lots yep. during that period, uh, did the council, did the plaintiff uh, rate six separate lots and then aggregate them? Yes, yes. Or did the council rate one single? Yes. Parcel of yeah. And my understanding, too, is that they say that they rated the one parcel all the lot. And yes, the rate is books. Yep. Yes, that's what I derive from these rate books. Now, Lisa Kennedy's assertions were simply palpably false. The rate book, which both Lisa Kennedy and the magistrate were referring to, 
is back on the screen. And as discussed earlier, the incontrovertible fact is that the rate book unequivocally specifies the six non-existent notional pieces or parcels of land. And it is impossible for Lisa Kennedy or anyone at all to conclude that the rate book shows no evidence of that fact and certainly provides no evidence of rating one property notional or not. On the face of it, Lisa Kennedy is bald-faced lying. Having said that, Lisa Kennedy's assertions are consistent with her expressing her personal knowledge of the physical actual land defined by fences and in the context of the fraudulent notions of same piece of dirt and lot and plan numbers per se of themselves being descriptions or descriptor for that same piece of dirt. Now, the magistrate swallowed the misrepresentations of Johnson, Harris and Kennedy whole, and then he gave me a nonsense lesson. He regurgitated the utterances of Johnson, Harris and Kennedy in the following little audio clip. Now once again, listen for what's on the screen. Okay, playing now. Surely uh, it seems to me the uh, council's entitled to rate of land irrespective of how that land is described. It could be described as lot ones, type of lease one, but the plan subdivision is one there, it could be described as volume, this volume, that could be described as flat paper, it could be described as a quarter acre, but I can't see the description. Land described as you, you could. Now, such nonsense absolutely precludes the operation of the Torrens title system and the notional pieces or parcels of land which are the core of that system. Such nonsense is only possible in the context of the fraudulent notions of legal description and same piece of dirt as put by the council and its lawyers. According to the magistrate, a council can rate actual land defined by fences and refer, it, refer to it however it wishes, including as Charlie's Paddock. And the council's barrister, Richard A. Harris, agreed. OK, now to cement the fact that the magistrate was less than moronic. I'm going to play another little audio clip of the magistrate. In this clip, he reads paragraph 34H of my written defence, which I referred to earlier and which is back on the screen now. And then the magistrate says the nonsense, which is also on the screen now. OK, playing now. Uh, it's over the page, it's subparagraph H, when you say, the defendant's saying that the council did not, could not validly write those appointments which were set out No, no, I didn't. Uh, no, sir. Not at all. OK. Now, it's difficult to imagine more imbecilic comments. The, ma the magistrate appears to have no notion that with the flick of his wrist, the registrar of titles creates and destroys notional pieces or parcels of land. And that process has zero to do with actual physical land, which the magistrate was referring to. Now this nonsense went on for four hours, and the magistrate's mind was shut to my submissions. I have demonstrated enough and shan't bore you further with the hearing nonsense. 
I will shortly play recordings of the magistrate's reasons, which were delivered after he had a couple of months to consider the true facts and the law, but did not. Now, the essence of the magistrate's opening remarks are on the screen. OK, playing now. From 1981, the Tilden land was part of a parcel of land um, uh, uh, affected by a plan of subdivision, namely Lodge Plan 134684, which was registered on the 12th of February, 2000, uh, 12th of February 1981. And upon registration of that plan, the rated land became known as Lot 1 on Lodge Plan 134684. Subsequently, in about 1983, that lot was the subject of several proposed further subdivisions, namely Lodge Plans 135199, Lodge Plan 135200, and Lodge Plan 135201. Hence, um, uh, for the rating year 1983-1984 until the rating year 1990-1991, the land was described in the plaintiff's documents not as Lot 1 on Lodge Plan 134684, but as Lot 1 on Lodge Plan 135199, Lot 2 on Lodge Plan 135200, and Lots 3 to 6 on Lodge Plan 135201. In this regard, I refer, refer to the, the distinct restatement of uh, these matters at the <coughs> um, in uh, at the paragraph uh, at the foot of um, both paragraphs one and paragraphs two of the certificate of Mr. Johnson. Then. Uh, <clears throat> next, from 1991-1992 onwards, the land was again described by its original dis description, Lot 1 on Lodge Plan 134684. Now, there is no need for me to comment on the self-evident absurdity of the magistrate's opening comments, which essentially parrot the fraudulent notions of legal description and same piece of dirt which the council and its lawyers used to deceive him. Now, the text of the next little audio clip of the magistrate's preposterous reasons is on the screen now. And again, he parroted the fraudulent notions. OK, playing that little clip now. Importantly, uh, Ms Kennedy maintained that in all relevant years, and notwithstanding the change or changes in description in the plaintiff's documents, the actual land that was rated um, was the same throughout. OK, now for completeness, I will now play the little audio clip where the magistrate dismisses my defence and particularly dismisses paragraph 34 of my defence. The magistrate then again parrots the fraudulent notions as to legal description and same piece of dirt. OK, playing that self-explanatory clip now. Next, the defendant's, um, <coughs> uh, next is the defendant's argument which emerges from paragraph 34 of the final defence um, and which was relied upon heavily by um, Mr Thompson in argument. Um, regarding the uh, non-existence of uh, the rated land. In my view, <clears throat> merely to attempt to restate this argument is to reveal that it is misconceived. The plaintiff at all times, according to the uncontested evidence of Ms Kennedy, um, rated the same, inverted commas, actual land, inverted commas, to use Mr Thompson's expression. Um, the fact that the land was, um, for some of the relevant years, described by the plaintiff in its rates documents as being part of one or other subdivisions is, to my mind, not to the point. The rate of the land remained the same actual land throughout. In my view, the argument contained in the paragraphs that I've refer of the final offence to, to which I've referred uh, is misconceived. So, as you heard, the magistrate said that my defence was misconceived, whereas the fact is it was the magistrate who had no concept at all. 
he merely abandoned his judicial duty and blindly accepted and parroted the palpable nonsense put to him. The magistrate did not and could not hold a reasoned belief as to his published reasons. Now by the time the magistrate gave his reasons, I had sufficiently analysed the hearing and concluded the fraud upon the court substantially as I have set out in this video. But it was too late. Now, after the magistrate gave his reasons, the counsel's in fact fraudster barrister, Richard A. Harris, sought orders that I pay punishing indemnity costs for having brought a false defence which was in the face of the law and the facts. The magistrate then asked me if I had anything to say in regard to that application. So, in a polite and slightly obtuse manner, I told the magistrate that the council had brought a fraudulent claim. I said that in the fullness of time it would become, become apparent why the council had succeeded on the distinction between land and property. That was, an that was an obtuse statement by me as to, the as to the distinction between the fraudulent notion of actual land defined by fences as opposed to the true foundation of property in our system, namely the notional portions of land defined by the lot and plan numbers filed in the land titles office. Okay, I will now play the audio clip of that little exchange. All right, well, Mr Thompson, um, you've been on notice of this application since uh, last month at least. Um, uh, do, you want to, do you want to say anything in opposition to it? Uh, so there's not much really I can say, um, um, except to just to, if it make, makes it easier, I, um, I don't resile from anything that I have said. And, um, and in the fullness of time, I think the reasons will become apparent why the council have succeeded today, uh, apparently on the distinction between property and land. I think they thoroughly understand the, the, the difference. And um, so, um, so uh, in my submission, I have simply acted honestly and not, not in the face of um, the law or the facts. Now, in this case, the magistrate did not make a legitimate error of law or fact. He simply did not even attempt to perform his judicial function. He instead, during the course of the hearing, knowingly or uncaringly, simply adopted and parroted the things constituting the fraud upon the courts by Harris and Stiles in conspiracy with the council and its officers. He then knowingly or uncaringly set out those things in his purported reasons for decision. By doing so, the magistrate also committed a separate fraud upon the court and upon me. So, in this rate claim case, there were two distinct instances of fraud upon the court. Firstly, by the lawyers, Harris and Stiles, conspiring with the council and its officers to defraud the court, and secondly, by the magistrate himself. Now, at this time, it is relevant to set out the consequences of fraud upon the court. Now, fraud upon the court gives rise to a particularly unique circumstance or consequence. That circumstance and consequence is that because fraud vitiates all that it touches, then any purported judgments and court orders made in the circumstances of fraud on the court are themselves vitiated and of no lawful effect. And the beneficiary of such flawed judgments and orders are not entitled to receive or retain the benefits of such vitiated judgments and orders. Further, any person knowingly relying on such vitiated judgments or orders 
and receiving or retaining fraudulently obtained benefits are committing further most serious fraud. Now, fraud on the court must be distinguished from fraud in the court. Fraud in the court occurs when a party to the, litig to the litigation commits perjury or falsifies documents or conceals evidence or coaches witnesses to give false evidence. In such circumstances, the judicial machinery and impartiality of the court was not compromised, and any judgments and orders made, although fraudulently obtained, they are not vitiated. Such fraudulently obtained judgments and orders stand as lawful judgments and orders. However, an aggrieved party may make application to courts of appeal to have such fraudulently obtained judgments and orders set aside. So the distinguishing feature between fraud on the court and fraud in the court is that judgments and orders made in circumstances of fraud on the court are vitiated ab initio and are of no lawful force or effect, while judgments and orders fraudulently obtained from fraud in the court are lawful and stand until and unless set aside. Now, the presently significant aspect here is that in 2018, by several emails to each and every Macedon Ranger Shire councillor, I provided them with a copy of Peter Johnson's certificate and I set out su sufficient particularities of the perjury. Those emails also set out full particulars of the rate fraud, including cooking the rate records, which Ms Kennedy and Peter Johnson were seeking to conceal by their perjury. The then acting Macedon Rangers CEO, Mr Dale Thornton, replied by the letter which is on the screen now, and in, in essence he said that an investigation did not support my allegations, and in fact substantiated the actions taken by the officers in the legal proceeding. I replied by email of 17th of July 2018 and bluntly said that I conclude that Thornton was a liar or incompetent. As I have learned, the truly corrupt double down and compound their corruption when faced with the truth. Sure enough, they did double down. The present CEO, Ms Margot Stork, replied by the letter which is on the screen now, and she endorsed Thornton's reply and threatened to block my emails. Then, by email of 12th of February 2019, I provided each and every councillor with further particulars of the corrupt conduct of the council, and which is now particularised in this video. As anticipated, by letter dated 14th of February 2019, which is on the screen now, the present CEO, Margot Stork, again compounded the corruption by threatening me with legal action if it was found that my statements were false and defamatory. Now, I will be exceedingly blunt. Ms Stork is a trained lawyer, and the business model of all councils is the rating of notional properties. And the absolute surety is that Stork and each and every councillor knows full well that never in, the his never in history has the council or any council rate records described a particular property by or with the particulars of one or more separate and disparate and discrete other properties. They also know full well that a reference to a particular lot and lodge plan number is a specific and unequivocal reference to that particular unique and discrete notional property and is not and cannot be construed to be a reference to any other property at all. 
In other words, in simple terms, each of the councillors and Miss Stork are well aware that Johnson did not and could not hold a belief as to his certificate and they knew full well that the certificate of Peter Johnson is false and perjurious and intended to pervert the course of justice. They further know that by authoritatively denying and concealing that fact, they are authoritatively concealing serious indictable offences and perpetuating an hour 39 year rape fraud against me. I chose not to appeal the decision and orders of the magistrate. I could not appeal without honestly setting out the corrupt conduct which had occurred and by the things set out in the video linked in the description and at the end of this video I, and which I discussed earlier, I had well and truly learned that the entire justice system conceals and denies court-based corruption. Thank you for watching. Please like and share and subscribe to my channel. The End